he attempted to play the role to of the grieving widower to the best of his ability, and which he did very well. Yeah, it's a facade, isn't it? It's the the idea that something really, really unspeakable is going on, you know, behind that. The thing that I could never really uh, get my head around was how he planned it all so meticulously and how he really believed he was going to get away with it. I'm Nicola Tallent and you're listening to Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the sins of the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. When killer Joe O'Reilly bludgeoned his wife Rachel to death at their home in the Knoll in County Dublin in October 2004, he thought he'd get away with murder. But years after he was convicted to a life sentence for his dreadful crime, nobody could have expected that the former advertising executive would continue to fascinate the public. This week, he's yet again to be the subject of a new documentary to be screened on RTE, while a Channel 5 programme is also airing. So what is it about Ordinary Joe and his plot to kill 17 years ago that is rarely far from the headlines? And why do people still want answers to his awful crime? Today, I'm talking to journalist Jenny Freel, whose book, The Suspect, is the definitive account of murder in the Knoll. She tells me about her extraordinary meetings with the killer as he protested his innocence, the gruesome murder tours he took her on in his home, and how his tall tales and desire for recognition eventually backfired on him in spectacular fashion. This is Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. Did you ever think back in 2004 that you'd go out in a story and you'd be still talking about it 17 years later? No. Short answer. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah, no, it was something that's just gone on. And still, like, you know, it's not just, you know, my professional life, but in my personal life as well, you know, people ask about it. They always come around to it at a dinner party. Well, sure, I was up in Ballyshannon at the weekend where my husband's from and uh, one of his friend's fathers, like, you know, straight in with the, oh, I saw Rose Callaly on the route to television recently and wanted to know about where I thought Joe was, like, how, what yeah. he was up to or whether he was going to get out or... And then in, in, inevitably, they always ask about Nikki Pelly as yeah. well. Is he still with Nikki? Well, I mean, look, I have to admit, I even do find it a fascinating story. And I think mm. I've quizzed you quite a few times on it as well. Yeah. I'm sorry to do it again, Jenny. You're in the hot seat there. But, um, you know, not to downgrade any murder or to say any murder is an ordinary story because it wasn't that. It was a horrendous situation we were greeted with. Um, a young mother battered to death in her house, um, a Garda team looking for a killer and two little boys left, you know, without a parent. Horrendous. But, you know, as a reporter, I suppose we do cover a lot of these things and, you know, some of these cases just are parked and you the families have to fight to have them recognised. Yeah. But for some reason, Rachel O'Reilly and... Uh, indeed her husband Joe, seemed to have what you could crassly call the X factor. Yes, you could crassly call it that. Yeah, it's yeah, they did. It, it, yeah, there was a lot to it. But I think ultimately the main fascination came with that Joe made himself so available from the very beginning. Mm. And he he attempted to play the role to, of the grieving widower mm. um, to the best of his ability, and which he did very well. Um, he And he said yes to a number of interviews, including one with me. Um, and it just, it just blew up. Mm. Um, I think if he was to have his time back again, he uh, would know not to have done that. Um, not that I think it would have changed the outcome mm. by any stretch, but I think that maybe the attention that that particular case got right. might not have been as big. But there were the other factors that you mentioned there. The, the, the fact that, you know, Rachel was in a house, like, you know, an ordinary um, mother of very two very small children. Mm, mm. Like, they were toddlers at the time. Um, and, you know, she was uh, killed so brutally. Mm. And the fact that she was found by her mother, um, and I think, you know, that... For a few days, there was this idea that there was like, you know, a murderer or murderers on the loose in North Dublin somewhere. Um, and then 
all the stuff that the, you know, and then it emerged that he was having an affair and then it emerged that, uh, well, during the trial, some of that incredible evidence came up and was the first time, Mm. you know, that some of the technical evidence had ever been used to such incredible effect here. So all of those things. And I suppose from the beginning of it, we were looking at what we thought was the perfect family. It was this very middle class couple with their lovely home, Mm-hmm. Outside Dublin, two gorgeous little kids. Um, he had a very good job. She yeah. seemed to be working from home, yet yeah, juggling a career as well. And they were very good looking and they just were, seemed to be the perfect family. But as we sort of, after that tragedy occurred and we started scratching behind the surface, we could see that it was far from that. Yeah. And maybe that was part of... The fascination, yeah. really, was it? Yeah, I think so, and 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 also because Rachel, it, it it felt or it feels like Rachel had been very private about her marriage woes, about you know the fact that Joe had pulled back and um, she was worried about their marriage, but mm. he had only really confided in maybe one or two friends at most that we still know of to this day. Um, so yeah, they they did they were portraying that perfect family unit mm. you know they, they played softball they were on the same softball team there was a lot of you know barbecues in the neighborhood and Rachel was very into that that's why she had wanted to move out to the Nile in the first place to have to, to provide their children with that kind of you know almost Walton-esque kind mm. of um, childhood and uh, so yeah I think I think that was a big part of it's that yeah it's that facade isn't it mm. it's the the idea that something really really unspeakable is going on, you know, behind that, because that's the other thing I think that caught people's fascinations and certainly mine, the thing that I could never um, really uh, get my head around was how he planned it all so meticulously Mm. and how he really believed he was going to get away with it. Um, He was, he's quite an extraordinary person, really. So bring you back to 2004 and you're in the newsroom. Yes. And you're asked to go out and yeah. see what you can well, establish. It's a, yeah, it's a fairly typical, you know, request um, to a reporter in a newsroom. It's kind of like go out and basically door knock, knock on someone's door, mm. see if they'd be willing to talk about um, the uh, the victim and their loss. So is, this was in the, the, the week, I presume, after? Well, it was about a week and a half, I'd say, maybe about, yeah, about seven or eight days later. And... Um, yeah, it took me ages to find because they're out in the, the house is out in the middle of nowhere up in the Nall. So um, I found it. It's beside a quarry, Murphy's Quarry. So eventually found it. Um, no one there. Um, I knew that the mom lived up in that, that not uh, that Joe Riley's mother lived up in um, Dunleer. So uh, I kind of figured that if they weren't in the house, they might be up there. Called up there. No sign either. So just on my way home, I thought I'll just give it one more shot. Call into the house in the Nall again and. Lo and behold, Joe and his mum, Anne, were there. Now, had you seen photographs of him up to this point? He had been photographed? I don't think so. No, I don't remember. But he was in the background as the grieving As the grieving husband. father. No, at that stage, I think there were only pictures of Rachel out there. Okay. So I didn't know who I was looking, going to be looking at or looking for or anything. Mm. So, yeah, so Joe came, to the, they looked wrecked. I remember that. I remember them coming to the door and them just looking shattered. And I was because I don't think they used the front door much. It was that typical Irish home where they used the back patio door all the time to get in and out. And, uh, you know, like, you know, this 17 years ago, like, I, I suppose I had a fair amount of experience at door knocking at that stage. But it's it's not an easy or a nice thing to do. It's just part and parcel of the job. But you're always aware that, you know. It's awful. It's awful. Yeah, it's awful. Mm. So, but you're you're trying to be as... You don't want to be intruding on someone's grief, but yeah. you at the same time have to give them an opportunity. Exactly. I mean, and at this point, he is presumably looking for his wife's killer. Yeah. And and he, and he did give a number of interviews, like mm. to RT, to radio, uh, television news, um, I think, and obviously the infamous Late Late Show appearance. But, um, and they were very polite, I have to say. It's like you kind of go up with your heart in your mouth a bit because sometimes you can get a, a less than mm. friendly response. But um, he... He was immediately kind of receptive to the idea, which I was quite surprised at um, because I suppose it was still kind of like quite recent. Mm. Um, I had kind of gone fully expecting to be told, no thanks, thanks, but no thanks. 
So um, he said he couldn't do it at the time. Would I come back later that night to the house um, that he had his stuff to do? So that suited me grand. It meant I could go off and get a photographer and go back to the house. And did so. you tell him, like, that you were be coming back? Was it okay to come back with a photographer? Oh, yeah. He was all okay with that. Yeah, yeah. it was all fine. What were your first impressions of him? I mean, he's... He's tall. Mm. Yeah, big guy. Um, and kind of... Did you think he was sort of a big, gentle yeah, soul? Yeah, there's something quite kind of like, um, the voice is soft enough. He's kind of, he's kind of a bit, you know, um, he's, yeah, gentle, I suppose, is, is a nice word of, saying it goofy. maybe a bit little bit goofy yeah you wouldn't like you, you know yeah you wouldn't be finding him massively uh, attractive as such just he's he's very pleasant okay. a very pleasant man and he was uh friendly and his mum was nice as well she always was um Anna Riley and uh so yeah, he, so we went back. I went back with the photographer that night. It was eight o'clock, late enough now to be doing it. Um, but uh, and it was freezing cold. I remember it was freezing cold. We were in the pitch dark. I was panicking about whether I'd find the place again because this is pre Google Maps or you know all that kind of stuff. So um, we went to the door, and he was very friendly. He was nervous. He was visibly nervous when we went in, um, and he was offering us tea and all the rest and everything, and. It kind of took me a few moments to realise that we were actually in the house where it had happened. You know, I, I wasn't thinking, you know, straight, I suppose, maybe, or I hadn't really, that hadn't really considered, kind of it. considered mm. it. Because the house was freezing, you know, to the point of where we didn't take off our coats, really. And he was in a big kind of navy um, wooden jumper. And he was apologising for that. And he was apologising for the mess in the house because obviously the police had turned it upside down and the kids, he and the kids weren't living there. They were staying up with his mum and Lear. So he had agreed to meet me there so we wouldn't be disturbing the children in the mother's house. So but you could have met We could have met elsewhere, anywhere. yeah? You could have, yeah. you were going to just sit down and talk to him. You could have met in a pub or in listen, a coffee shop. Listen to it. For a reporter, it's gold, you know, because mm-hmm. it's all colour. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's all it's all adds to the You're able experience. to describe what the house was like. Exactly. And like, you know, there were notes on the fridge. There were notes on the fridge, I remember, from the pe- the children, um, like Happy Mother Day okay. kind of stuff, you know, like stuck with magnets and stuff. I remember looking around and thinking, looking at that and you do. Yeah, that's a real moment where you just go, God, what happened here? You know, mm. but um, so, yeah, he was lovely. And. There was the embarrassing moment, and I've told the story a million times, but um, I'd forgotten to bring a notebook. Um, There was a bit of a kind of like a a bit of a laugh about that. And he very kindly went off and got me a brand new hard book kind of, you know. He found you amusing that you'd forgotten your notebook. I think that kind of helped put him at ease a bit because I was coming across as a bit gormless, I suppose. Mm. But um, so we sat down and he was like we were there for about the guts of two hours, probably longer. And uh, he was great, like, to interview. He, like, everything. He obviously wasn't telling me the truth. But, uh, like, you could ask him. But you, at the time, thought he was. And, of course. And he, yeah. was, he was telling you the details of what happened or he was, he was telling you how he was feeling, which... Both. Both. Because you, th- you walk an interviewee through mm. all of that stuff. You get them to tell you chronologically what happened. And then the, the ultimate and the, the most important questions are, how do you feel? Mm. Like, how did that make you feel? Like, and what's happening now and what you hope to happen? Um, so he was, yeah. And, and actually the photographer sat in with me, um, as they often do. Um, and Chris would have, like he was in, you know, he was a veteran photographer at that stage. who worked for PA for a lot of his career. Um, and I could tell he was fascinated with it all. You know, he was great to have there because he was just nodding along and like, you know, short of asking questions himself kind of thing. But uh because it's it's rare that, that's not that rare but like it's it, it's rare to get up that close and personal with someone that quickly mm. after such a horrendous thing happens because it, it was only a few days later really you mm-hmm. know um so and yeah. it's very raw and yeah. as you say the notes are still on the fridge at this point mm. um you know, he hasn't cleared. She, she, she essentially, or her spirit, or whatever yeah. you would call it, is still in the house. It's still a family home where yeah. a mother, probably that morning, fed her two children at that kitchen table and dropped them to school, and and then yeah. their lives are shattered within a few hours later in the day. But um, so all of that is giving you 
a really good and powerful picture then as oh, yeah. a writer yeah. to be able to describe this devastation. Yeah. And, and you know, like it, it's like a good book or a good movie. Like, you know, something goes by very quickly because like I remember, you know, sitting into the car afterwards and, you know, looking down and I think it was like half ten or something. We couldn't believe we'd been there that long, but mm. we, we packed a lot into it, you know. Um, and he was, he, and he was, I thought he was being very stoic. You know, um, because he was, you know, he uh, and I felt that he was telling his story as best or he was telling the events of what happened as best he could, because, as you mentioned earlier, it's about, you know, doing everything you can to find the killers. And also, I have never had anything horrendous like that happen to my life, to, mm. to me in my life or any of my loved ones. So I'm not sure you can ever predict how you would react or behave in such a situation so I always give someone the benefit of the doubt you know like I don't think people act weird mm. you know I, I think that they you know that they act as they're acting because they're coping with whatever trauma they are coping with mm. but um he was good he was um and he you know we, we talked we, we went back to when they first met he was telling me about her childhood the fact that the family had gone to live in Australia for a year but had come back because they weren't happy had they all all the Callaly children had been adopted and you know that was something that Rachel was uh you know very um involved in I think that she'd made contact with her birth family not long before she was murdered um he was incredibly open and mm. he was telling me about his life where he went to school how they met in Arnott's how he joined the local he her, overheard her saying that she were played softball for a particular team so he joined up so in order was, to meet her in order to meet her because he had spotted her she was quite tall he was six foot five I think or something and he is six foot five and I think she was she was quite tall as well so she know he noticed her straight away um, and also she was gorgeous. She was, you know, blonde, bubbly, friendly, um, uh, you know, f friendly woman. So he pursued her mm. and he made no like bones about that. And, um, and was he showing you pictures of this as you went along? And No, we got to the pictures later. Um, he because pictures obviously are always a huge part of a newspaper article. Mm. Um, so and like, I think that's a. Uh, I think that was the first time, that was the only time throughout the interview where he kind of showed, um, you know, a, a, a large amount of uh, emotion. He took out the the wedding albums, which were these huge, big, you know, those um, leather bound books mm. that people get. And, uh, you know, they'd had the whole, th the shebang, like they had had, like, you know, I think it was a Rolls Royce and several bridesmaids. And, you know, I think he was in short having a top hat kind of thing. Like he was full on lovely wedding. And yeah. uh, I do remember he was saying that um, he hadn't seen these albums in a very long time. And there was a few moments where he had to kind of pull himself together. And, you know, there was definitely and, and, and I think that emotion was real. And I was going to say that that probably seemed, you know, familiar to you, even though we can never imagine how we would behave mm. in these circumstances. We can surely imagine that we'd be devastated and oh, yeah. tearful and... Oh, no, yeah. Enable to maybe do an interview. That's how I sort of mm. feel I would maybe be, but I don't know. You, you, uh, you don't think you would be able to? I don't think so. I don't mm. think I'd be able to speak. I don't think I'd be yeah. able to, I mean. But like, if they have been murdered? You have to, you have to go on autopilot. And yeah. you do, and of course, the focus will be to find the killer yeah. and, yeah. you know, the thoughts that somebody who has done that to your loved one is out there. Yeah. Um, but as you're sitting... Mm. He suggests. As we, so we, so we, we, we come to the, you know, to the, the day of when it happened, you know, and this is a good, like, you know, 45 minutes, an hour into the interview, you know, so we get, come to the day. So it's like, can you talk me through what happened that day? Where were you? He, you know, he was going off to the gym and uh, he got the phone calls from the crash owners to say that Rachel hadn't turned up. And then he kind of came up to, well, um, when I got back to the house, um, Rose came running out and uh, she told me not to come into the house with the kids. He had brought the children with him. Um, and uh, then, you know, she brought me down to the bedroom and I was going, oh, right. She goes, and all of a sudden he says, do you want to see where it happened? And you just kind of go, pardon? How do you answer that? <laughs> well, you, you have to answer in the affirmative yeah. because like it's a, it's a great moment, mm -hmm. you know, like it's, you can't give, you can't pass it up, even though you might not want to. Mm. And I remember kind of looking over at Chris and kind of going, oh, 
And he's going, well, yes. So we got up and followed him down to the um, bedroom. And yeah, um, it's a bungalow. So, you know, you kind of go out the kitchen and down a, kind of like a corridor where it was three bedroom bungalow. And uh, their bedroom was at the end of the corridor opposite the bathroom, I think. And um, he was apologising again for the state of the house. And he was saying, you know, you're going to notice because they had taken away the entire door jam because the forensics had been in. So like it it like it, it was a, like a murder scene, like it was quite... Um, uh, Disturbed. Dist- yeah, it, very much so. And then so he turns on the light and it's like, you know, real stark light because it, like, it's pitch black outside, you know, like it was, mm. I think it was the middle of October at this stage or coming into November maybe. But um, he went into the bedroom and I remember myself and Chris, we were kind of standing at the doorway. You kind of didn't want to go actually into the bedroom, but, and we had a good enough view of like what was going on. There were black uh, black bags of clothes and stuff on the bed and it was a mess and uh, he basically showed us what he thought had happened you know during the attack um, so there was a big hole in the carpet where they had cut out where her body had lain so it was concrete underneath mm. and then it was just this huge kind of oval sh- shape so it wasn't like a you know like a chalk outline of her body or anything it was just this and it was where her body and probably her, the, the you know, uh, yeah where her body the length been, of what her body would have been lying yeah and more like yeah. just the whole kind of like thing chunk had been taken out and he actually got down on one knee and um, and he, he did this with other people with, with a lot of other people as we heard through the trial this was what became known as his famous murder tours exactly so um, he got down on one knee and he started bringing his hand up behind his head, holding the imaginary murder weapon. And he basically kind of like, you know, brought it down where he said he thought, you know, where, where well, where he knew, because he had seen where her body was, where he knew Rachel's head had been. And um, basically said that, yeah, this is what kind of like probably happened. And, he, you know, she, the, the murderer brought like whatever the weapon was down in her head several times. And he did this repeatedly himself. Yeah, he did it about three or four times. And I remember that we were kind of, I just remember myself, and what you say? You know, Surreal. You, it's, yeah. And you, you, you don't say anything. You're quite, I remember feeling quite nauseous, actually. Um, and because uh, I had to excuse myself to go to the bathroom at one stage just to, and Take Jenny, was the room cleaned or no, was there no, still blood? No, he was pointing out, he was pointing out the blood spatter on the walls. He was kind of like, because the door jam had been taken out, even though it had been taken out because there had been so loads of blood on the door jam, there was still, and it, it, you know, blood kind of goes brown after a while. So there's just all this kind of brown specks and he was pointing it all out and you could still see some of it on some of the carpet. And, and suggesting why it was there and mm-hmm. why it was here because of the way... She had been killed. Yeah. And what an odd situation to find yourself in. Yeah, it was. And you see, the thing was, I suppose because I was younger and not as experienced as I am now, um, I kind of didn't realise at the time how unusual it was. Because I can tell you now that's never happened again. (laughs) Um, So I didn't really quite grasp how weird this situation was mm. you know I I, I, I kind of came away uh, but it was one of the things that the photographer mentioned to me in the car on the way down he said in all my career like you know I've never, never gone seen. never seen anything like that and he was a smoker you know, like you know the minute we got into the car he was like you know the bags were coming out and he was you know puffing the whole way back to Dublin but um, it was yeah but you had to go and steady yourself I yeah went into the bathroom and kind of took a few deep breaths and kind of like came back out again and went down and um, we resumed the the interview then and you know so he did this and then he you were brought back up to the kitchen where he continued yeah talking as yeah if that was just part of the story yeah he had just been you know giving us another I suppose pillar to build the you know interview mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. but like. As we know now, he, he clearly got some kick, some, some I don't know, some kind of satisfaction out of bringing people 
to do that because Rose and Jim Callally have spoken before about mm. how they didn't really want to be shown. They had and would, would from your estimates of the days after it and from their interviews about these murder tours that they yeah. were also brought on, did theirs happen before or after yours? Oh, I'm not sure. I would imagine before because I think there was a lot of activity. Like, you know, well, because the house was closed off for a while. So um, did it feel rehearsed when you were brought on it? Yeah, that's fair. That's a fair point. It did. Yeah, for sure. Like I I did kind of, you know, like, yeah, if you're asking me, was it kind of spontaneous or was it, did I feel he'd probably maybe done this before? Not that I gave it all that much thought at the Mm -hmm. time, but in hindsight, yeah, I would Mm -hmm. say that he'd, uh, he'd done it a few times, all right. And we know he did. Like, there were other friends that he did that. And not even friends, like, vague, na- like, neighbours that he would have known vaguely. Do you want to see where it happened? And the same scenario down on one knee and... He told, I think during the trial, he said, one of the neighbours said that she hadn't really wanted to, but he had said to her that some people had said to him it brought them a sense of peace. You know, like, that he he had... So he was encouraging people mm-hmm. to go down with him to the bedroom. mm now, when you went back and, and you finished the interview with mm. him, I mean, you were obviously at that point through his reaction, initial reaction to the murder and what he was hoping for, in other words, to catch the killer. Yeah. What sort of emotions did he ha- display after he had taken you on this weird murder tour? He, in the sense of when he was talking about who he thought might have done it, mm. He was, I, he was kind of saying there had been speculation in the papers at the time that it had been a gang that had been hitting North Dublin at the time. Um, and so he mentioned that and he said that, you know, it would have to have been someone who was quite strong because Rachel was quite strong and she wouldn't have gone down without a fight. I remember him saying things like that um, and that, you know, uh, and then there was a, you know, there was, he there is, you know, him wondering about why, you know, that it happened down in the bedroom. And I did ask him at one point, you know, did he think that maybe she'd had an affair? Um, and he he was a bit taken aback at that question, actually. And he was kind of saying, you know, well, no, I hadn't thought about that. But, you know, maybe we'll never know now. But I don't know. So he was somewhat forgiving of her if she had. Well, knowing what we know now, mm. um, you know, I think... Maybe all along he was. Yeah. Well, he was. You see, and that's the that was always the thing about Joe O'Reilly. I think he always thought he was cleverer than he was. Mm. Like how he didn't think that his relationship with Nikki Pelly was going to come out. You know, or how he didn't. You know, just various other bits. How and he thought he was going to get away with how it. He really. he well, he nearly it. did. Yeah. But we'll come to that. Um, you're. Describing it with some cynicism now, when you look back <laughs> as you sit into the car and this weird situation yeah. had happened. But at the time, you came away oh, yeah. believing that this was... Very nice man. Who a nice just man who suffered. this had happened to. And you, you, as you say, you can't expect how you'd react in that situation. So this weird mur- murder tour you had put down to the fact that, okay, it's just a reaction to... Yeah. Yeah, what has happened. Yeah. So yeah. as you're driving away, you've met what you believe to be a, a tragic husband who's lost his wife. Yeah. And you see, you, you use the word cynicism there. Like, I'm going back to a newsroom filled with cynicism. Um, so, you know, I remember asking the photographer, Chris, um, you know, do you think he, he could have done it? And he goes, I don't know, but I, I, I really hope not. I liked him. You know, right. so like that. So you weren't was, alone. Yeah. So I wasn't alone. So we did have that conversation. But and when we got back, I was very vocal in my, you know, um, because I, often in a lot of these cases as well, like there's, you know, cynicism can lead to, you know, Some assumptions have been in the wrong. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They lead to they can mm. lead to assumptions being made that aren't right. So you know, like, and our job is to keep an open mind. You know, just as much as the Gardaí or, you know, whoever. So I was keeping an open mind. Mm. But you kept not only an open mind, but you also kept in touch with them. Yeah. And um, you, the case went on. He, some weeks later, went on the Late Late Show and it was fairly clear at that point that 
Rose Callally. Oh, yeah. Believed yeah. that he had more to do with it than he was letting on. Well, that was the turning point, really, wasn't it? Mm. The Late Late Show. Um, and we know now that Rose had been told by Gardy at that point. There's a, it's really interesting. There was an interview that he did with RT News with Rose and Jim, Jimmy, um, in, I don't know whose house it was in. I think it might have been Rose and Jimmy's, but um, they were all sit, all three of them were sitting on the sofa together, I think. But I just remember them sitting quite closely and them being, you know, a unit and looking at each other when they were talking and, you know, being there for each other. And then a few weeks later, they went on The Late Late Show and the it was the polar opposite. It was Ray, Rose could not look at him. Her face, she is she is a Dublin mammy, like she is. She's a gorgeous woman and she is um but you would I don't think you'd cross her, you know. And she uh I remember I remember her just staring straight ahead. And I we know now that she was looking out at her family because they were in the audience. Um and uh when Joe spoke, she she could not, she just she couldn't even mm. look at him. She just And do you remember at that point you were still in touch with him maybe? Yeah. And like when I say you were in touch with him, you weren't ringing him every week or anything, but no. you were you were getting you were called maybe called out a few times. Called to, out of the house a few times, text, met him out in Bluebell where he was working, I think, twice. Um so yeah, no, and like and also this was over a long time. Like mm. that court case didn't like God, it's 2007 that 2007. happened in, so it's three years, yeah. or certainly up to three years. Yeah. Now, I didn't keep in touch with him for the entire three years because um, I'd say, because he, he 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 actually, you know, obviously took a step back. He knew not to keep kind of, you know, talking mm. to journalists after a while, you know. So. After he became the suspect. Yeah. You know, but while he thought he was in control and he thought he was the one yeah. that was, that, that his narrative was working, basically. He was a, certainly a very friendly. Mm -hmm. um, did he try and drum up stories with you or did you always have to go to no, him? No, no, in fairness now, now I would have always rung him or texted him mm. or asked to meet him or whatever. And he was always very, um, he was always very, um, he was always very accommodating, actually. I remember being going out to the house once and it must have been in the springtime because he was bringing, taking out the, because their garden was quite big. It had a bit of land around it. And uh, I just always remember the kids being there and just, you know, how, just how sad it was, mm. you know, that uh, like he was there with his kind of like ride on motor, you know, um, lawnmower and the kids kind of like, you know, running around and playing. And they're really friendly, lovely little things. But um, so, yeah, no, he was, but he was quite open. But as, as time went on, you could tell that the um, relationship between himself and the Calities had completely, well, he was very open about it, had completely broken down. Um, now, you know, he would have, asked, like a lot of the stuff that he would have kind of said was off the record and he was just kind of like saying it. And But he was quite, I should have put it, he was quite bitchy about them, mm. you know, and he, mm. like suggesting that there was a lot more to, you know, uh, Rachel's, you know, relationship than people thought, like it wasn't the big happily family that everyone thought it was, whatever. But that was him manipulating, mm -hmm. you know, a situation or trying to. And I think his relationship with the media went sour as well, didn't mm. it? As I suppose, as the investigation continued and maybe it became apparent that there was no burglary gang that day. No. There was no stranger that broke in there that day. No. And the likelihood was that this guy she was married to who was having an affair yeah. was the chief suspect. Well, you sure you just had to like the. I think he, he himself and um, Nikki Pelly and also Declan Querney, who gave him his alibi that morning. Um, they were brought in for questioning. I think on two occasions, all three of them, or maybe it was just once. I'm not sure. But the 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 um, the scrum that happened outside those guard stations, you know, that when they happened, like the the, the interest in it was just phenomenal mm. because you know. Because here was a guy who had gone on national television, you know, the biggest show in the country, um, you know, at a time when it was probably getting, you know, the highest ratings ever to say that, and, you know, where he was talking about his love for his poor murdered wife. And then, you know, a few weeks later, he's been kind of brought in for questioning mm -hmm. along with his girlfriend and the guy who gave him the alibi. Like it was quite the turn of events. And for yourself, I think your last meeting with him was a bit fraught. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Tell um, us about that. So, uh, 
um, I had, there was a story that the paper, they, they, there was a row over Rachel's tombstone between himself and the Callalees. Um, there, I, there was some kind of thing where I think Jim had, Jimmy had bought the, the plot and Joe had picked, uh, Joe had picked out a headstone with the boys or whatever, but the Callalees at this stage just didn't want to have anything to do with them. Like, they certainly didn't want him, you know, putting up a tombstone. Um, so that had become a bit of a problem. And I had heard about it and I, maybe he had told me or something like that, but I was going out and I asked, could I go out and meet him because um, I wanted to talk to him about this or whatever. And uh I said that they were going to run a story anyway um, about it. And he, he didn't want that. And he was very annoyed about it. And I got the stare, you know, like a bit, felt a bit like, you know, isn't this what IRA people do? Like and you were face to face with him? Yeah, we were in the conference room of his, um, the company that he was working for at the time. So he'd brought me in there. So it was just the two of us. And uh, he was, he was angry. You know, he was angry. He kind of went silent and there was a bit of, you know, um, bit of a stare off for mm. a few minutes and I was kind of suddenly aware that I hadn't brought anyone with me and you know but like actually look no I you didn't. know where you were in an office but yeah in the end of the day you were seeing a very different character very, a chameleon almost yeah. except that when we were leaving and when we were walking out he was doing that kind of um uh, people pleaser thing again that he 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 seemed to do where he was kind of saying, oh, you, you, you must have been, maybe you were a bit nervous coming in to meet me like this or whatever, you know, given what everyone's saying about me now. And I kind of tittered a bit and said, well, actually, and he was, I, I got the feeling he was kind of hurt. Right. You know, like it was, it was kind of, it was a strange moment where he, because I did, I was a little nervous, like not that I thought anything was going to happen, but, mm. you know, you're well, suddenly, it was different than the first time because this time you knew probably that you were going to meet a killer. Well, th or that he was certainly a, the main suspect, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. The trial. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. You sat almost beside him. I remember meeting you there a few times at yeah. the trial. And uh, did he ever make eye contact no. with you or anything? Did he ever allude to knowing you or to... No, no. And, and and that's funny, actually, because there was like there were a couple of days. This was in the old when they used to go to the four courts for these cases. So the setup was ludicrous. You know, like the press bench was the same bench where the accused sat. Mm -hmm. So one stage, I remember there was a couple of days. I remember one day that there was all there was between myself and Joe was a guard like or a prison guard. You know, like it was me, Joe at the end, prison guard and myself. And you're just kind of. You could have leaned in and talked to him. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But no, there was no. And and during the trial, there was a big, like, you know, like he, he was able to lean over the bench and talk to his legal team. There was a lot of, like, he was very chatty to the prison guard. Not the prison guards. They would have just been guards. Mm. Sorry, sure. He was, you know, he was. Uh, yeah, he was out on bail. He was out on bail. So he was, um, again, it was that people pleaser thing. He was. Like there was no kind of sitting there kind of being, you know, sullen or I'm a innocent man or obviously he was, you know, saying he was an innocent man. But he was, he, he's quite gregarious. He kept the act up really. And the only thing that goosed him was the phone records. Yeah. And it was always said had he left the phone in the office yeah. that day because of course what is believed happened was he went out to the house, he set up a... a an alibi for himself yeah. to, to state that he was somewhere else outside the office. He went out of the house, bludgeoned her to death, um, made his way back to the office yeah. and then staged well, that he was looking for her, that he was concerned she hadn't yeah. collected the kids. He was ringing around yeah. and he made his way back to the house knowing that her mother was going to well, discover. He had run, yeah, so he was in, so he worked for a company that did kind of like outside broadcasting. So it was the, bus station in Fibsborough, which he had gone to with this guy, Derek um, Querney. And uh, so it was handy for him because he was able to get onto the road that led straight out to the Nile. And um, and like that was all part of the evidence, like that those guards, the work they did, and that was incredible, like, you know, just, you know, testing that route over and over again. Um, so he did, he got up and he got back down again to the bus station and then he started ringing around. Well, 
The crash people rang, rang him first mm-hmm. to say that Rachel had not picked up one of the children. Then he started ringing around and he rang Rose. And uh, he, uh, I don't know if Rose remembers it, but I think at the time she kind of just had a feeling that, you know, there must be something seriously wrong if Rachel had not gone to collect the children. Mm. So she got in her car and headed out to the Nile. But he knew this, but he, she knew, he knew this in the meantime. So he went collected the two children who were being minded at the crash. And in the meantime, Rose had gone in and found her daughter on the floor. And the scene that she described in court of that was just... And has described, I was only listening to her recently. Yeah, I mean, was, it, it, it is, I mean... It was disgusting. It's unspeakable what she, dis- what she, she saw and had to go through. And yeah. the point you're making is that he knew he was going to put her through that. Yeah. He brought his children she, to that house with him. She came out and she said to him, don't bring the children in. He was about to walk into the house with the children. And she came out and said to him, don't bring the children in here. Rachel's up there and there's something wrong. So like, you know, would he have allowed the children to go into the bedroom and seen their mothers like that, mother like that? You know, I don't think we'll It just know. really is a stark mm. show of the lack of empathy that he, he has. Um, obviously the affair with Nikki Pelly came out during the trial um, and all the nasty things he was saying about Rachel in the background. Mm. He was found guilty and remains in prison. Yeah. But in prison has continued to protest his innocence. Yeah. Has appealed every which way he can. Yeah. And has only recently decided he's not going to go to Europe because yeah. he's probably coming towards the end of a life term. An average life term is 16 to 18 years yeah. and he has served 14 or 15 now. Yeah, yeah. So High profile prisoner like him. Yeah, uh, who still protests his innocence. Mm. He but he may no or may remorse. not get parole. He is certainly very high profile. And I think yeah. I think um, Rose Callaly still talks about him in order to yeah. try and keep that profile up. Oh, absolutely. And she does, like, she's, the, her energy is incredible because, like, that family have been through a lot. You know, Rachel's sister, Anne, only died about um, five or six years later of ill health. And, you know, they've, uh, they're amazing, really, what they have done and about keeping, you know, and it, it, I suppose it's, it's in Rachel's memory to make sure that she's not forgotten, but also that, um, you know, that people re- remember just exactly what it is that Joe Riley did and that he still won't admit it. Like, you, you wonder, would would there be some solace or some comfort they could take if he finally, he's not going to now, you know, like that's obvious, but, you know, w- would things have been different for them if he had admitted what he had done and shown some remorse? Like, would they have still felt the need to be as um, public as they are about it? Mm. But I think families do, because there's that awful system that has been changed recently, but where they came, when they come up for parole, they have to, you know, write letters to the parole board explaining why they don't think that the person should be released. Well, they still do. It's just okay. that the um, the yeah. time in which they can apply for parole has oh, been has lengthened. Changed. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was somebody who went in for parole as quickly as he could. Yeah. He believes he should be out. He believes that he, he should be seen as an innocent man, somebody who has been wrongly accused and somebody who should be freed. Well, his family still believe that mm. as well. And like, you know, that's that's an important part of this. That And so you can kind of understand why he has behaved the way he does. His, from my understanding, his two boys believe him to be innocent. Mm. So, you know, um, and that's their prerogative. But in hindsight and with some maturity, can you understand that? Because he was obviously an incredibly convincing liar. Yeah. And instead of actually having to you know, say that second hand as we do as, in, as journalists in a lot of cases, you have first-hand experience of that. Yeah. Like there's there's an element of this that he did, you know, that he did it for those boys in a way because he didn't, because he knew that those boys would be taken off, not taken off him. He did it so as he didn't have to be the McDonald's dad. Yeah. 
basically, so main custody would, would have been given to Rachel and he knew that. There was a whole section in the, the trial about, you know, that he had tried to basically get her, you know, framed as being an unfit mother and the social services had called out and interviewed them and, you know, uh, over whether she was being too aggressive with the children um, and all that kind of thing. And that was his, that was one of his efforts to try and maybe kind of get sole custody of the children. And when he saw that wasn't working, that's why he went down the route of murdering her. So, you know, he wanted... He wanted a family, but he just wanted Nikki to be there instead of Rachel. And Anne has often talked about that, like what, you know, they could have just divorced. Rachel could have gone on and met someone else. But he didn't want that because he didn't want to be, as you say, a weekend dad. He wanted to possibly just continue the way things were in that house. He moved those boys back into that house after the murder. And tell me this much because, you know, you wrote the book, The Suspect, and you're regularly still yes. asked to talk about it and to yes. talk about the mur- the famous murder tour, etc. Um, do you think about it at all outside that? Do you ever consider it? Do, do you ever think about that night in that house and have you mulled over what it was he was doing? I think... I think there's a certain part of you that has to kind of block that stuff out because if you did kind of... I, I tell you what it's put me off. I, I'm not a huge fan of crime shows um, that involve that kind of stuff because I just, you know, because I think you can you can kind of put it into the realm of almost that it doesn't happen. You know, that it's just some comes out of someone's imagination. Whereas in fact, like, this stuff is real. Like, this is what some people are capable of. And that's, that's Whereas awful. crime as a genre has almost become or has become an area of entertainment and people use it yeah. as entertainment and they watch the, shows, shows and they want that, all this. But you actually physically stood there and saw yeah. that. And I, yeah, and I just, I, like, I, like, it's not entertaining, you know, mm. like, it's just, like, I, I do understand the, the you know, the, the interest in it and the fascination absolute fascination with it but um, yeah I think maybe it would have like I don't I can't read thrillers and stuff like suspense kind of makes my heart race in ways I don't like Um, so I don't think that yeah it kind of like it had that I think effect on me Mm. Um, and also you know this would have happened anyway as like you know things went along but I'm a little less naive and trusting I think now um I would uh, hold my wish about whether, you know, if someone was to ask me whether they, I thought someone was innocent or not, I, I would I would say, let's give it some time. <laughs> let's wait and see. Let's wait and see, yeah. Uh, Jennifer Friel, thank you very much. 